I want to thank everyone for taking the time uh, to be with us today to ask uh, Jack Swarbrick some questions. We're here um, with uh, Jack, our university vice president, and James E. Ward, director of athletics. For anyone who wants to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom webinar uh, link. If you have a question and you're on the phone, feel free to shoot me an email at ahorvat3 at nd.edu or follow the email I sent out about 20 minutes ago. So we're going to take some time to ask Jack some questions. Um, and we'll get to as many as we, we can going forward. So Jack, I appreciate the time, but um, just getting going here. The first question is, is coming from uh, uh, Eric Hans from the South Bend Tribune. As NIL moves toward reality, the concept of guardrails seems to go hand in hand. What do you envision that looking like at Notre Dame? Thanks. Um, first of all, thanks to all of you for participating today. Um, I, I hope we can provide you some uh, useful information, but you've broken up my day from it being the same that it is every day. So thank you. Something a little different on these Groundhog Days is much appreciated. A um, couple of observations on NIL. The first is, while we all understand the, the pressures, both external and internal, that brought us to the point we currently are with the recent announcement of the uh, the broad parameters by the NCAA. Um, it sure feels like a time where a pause button would still nevertheless be welcome. It is so hard in the current context to have the sort of conversations that I think we ought to be having about the finer points of what will emerge as name, image, and likeness. And um, it's just very hard to do. Plus the financial landscape is gonna change so dramatically over the course of the next 12 months but again, it's a challenge to figure out how a concept that developed during what was fundamentally a different economic circumstance will play out uh, going forward. Having said that, in terms of guardrails, some of you know from my discussions with you on this, the NCA and I, not surprisingly, sort of wound up in very different places. Um, I had actually thought that uh, it would be it would be beneficial to have opportunities for the student and the university uh, to work together uh, in, in whatever form the name, image, and likeness activity took. Um, I thought that a separation should be drawn between the school acting as an agent or broker um, or representatives of the school acting as an agent or broker and the school participating as a co-licensee. And, and that was a distinction that was, that was lost as the guardrails came forward. You know, our focus is going to be very much on trying to make sure in whatever form this finally emerges that any, any opportunities created for our student athletes are true market-based opportunities. Um, we don't have the answers to how we'll make all of those decisions, but we'll have a process in place. I agree with the NCAA's emphasis on full disclosure. So it's my anticipation that each opportunity would be presented to us um, in advance of it being acted on. And we would have some opportunity to measure it against comparable market opportunities to confirm the non-participation of boosters or employees of the university, et cetera. Great, thanks. Heather Dinich from ESPN. How concerned are you about the challenges state by state reopenings will present? Are you worried at all about a competitive disadvantage against teams that might be able to return sooner? Yeah, thanks, Heather. I'm not concerned about a competitive advantage or disadvantage. Um, I've, I've accepted long ago in this pandemic that that's a natural consequence. And I have told our coaches over and over again, do not focus on that issue. Focus on health, that your health, the staff's health, and most importantly, the staff of our students and we'll go from there, whatever the consequences are, they are. Um, so there will be, there'll be great disparities, I think that are inevitable in this. The NCAA will do it, what it can, I think, to regulate them, but you're still gonna have circumstances where schools aren't open uh, and others are, or states haven't reopened and some have. I think the bigger challenge for us is the, the, the consequence that that will have on competing in the fall. It's one thing to say that one team gets a competitive advantage. It's another to say, what are the circumstances under which you could play? Um, you know, what's, what's, what's the record consequence of someone deciding they can't play? 
uh, or having a week they can't play because of a, an outbreak. Um, the whole notion of how we'll, how we'll pick a start date, um, even on a conference basis, um, given the complexities of different state regulations, different school approaches to opening, makes, makes the schedule building and figuring out how to evaluate what we'll have at the end of the day in the 2020 football season incredibly complex at this point. Um, we, we just face, as we stressed with the vice president, very different circumstances in the pro sports, who, who, I, who I think can figure out um, how, to, how to begin and begin all at once despite state differences. Many of our, most of our members are state institutions. Um, and we are certainly all universities, colleges and universities. Those two complexities are enormous when you're trying to figure out how to get going again. Yeah, we'll get this one out of the, out of the way as a lot of people have asked the question about the status of the Navy game. Um, at this point, it's still on the schedule. And uh, as Chet mentioned, our, our focus, in part because there's no reason to have a different focus, is on moving forward toward it. We get more information every day. We get more information from Ireland. We get a better sense of the state of college football generally and whether it can begin on time. But un un until so many of the blanks are filled in, uh, we're not at a point yet where, where we're prepared to do anything other than plan for it. And having said that, we recognize the risk. We recognize all the things that could happen in the next weeks and month uh, to cause us to decide we can't do that. But at present, it's still, still on the calendar and we're still preparing as if we're going to play it. And it's Dodd and Sue. Sports. Uh, in NIL discussions, do you believe Congress will have the will and or interest to grant antitrust exemption? What are the implications whether or not the exemption is granted? Well, the first part of that is, um, goes back to my earlier comment about the environment in which that's being asked. I, I think, you know, name, name the environment in which Congress is least likely to act. Um, an election year and a pandemic would be sort of be one and two on the list. So um, a little hard to have much confidence that we can get congressional attention. Once you're past the election, there's always a period of time where, where leadership settles in again. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the movement uh, legislatively at the NCAA and the opportunity to have a productive discussion with Congress are moving in, in uh, sort of on parallel paths here. Um, I, 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 think, I think the opportunity is there to get some limited protection, and I want to stress limited. Um, college athletics doesn't need, nor should it seek, broad antitrust exemption. Um, but as long as we're in an environment where we are individual institutions, the students with whom we work are not employees, so there isn't a collective bargaining solution. The alternative of every time a rule is made, and virtually every time a meaningful rule is made, you get sued on an antitrust claim, is not a tenable way forward. So I do think um, the student athletes and the schools would be well served with some limited exemption that everyone understood and that we could act in accordance with. Uh, Tim Priester from Irish Illustrated, uh, is May 15th, May 15th still a significant decision day for Notre Dame? And what do you anticipate will be determined by that date? Uh, it is significant um, to be determined then in the first instance is how the school will approach the second half of the summer term. Uh, Father John announced earlier that the first half of the term um, would be done online uh, with May 15 being the time to decide how we'd approach the second half of, of the summer term. So it's significant in the first instance in that regard. Um, that of course will help inform also the decision about moving forward beyond that. For us in athletics, um, it has an impact on whether we conduct any summer camps. We've already said we won't conduct any overnight camps, but um, if summer school were in session on campus, of the second half of the summer, we might consider some day camps again. But it also plays into the, the issue of when the football team would return and the, the circumstances under which they'd be preparing. Um, 
are the dorms open in the traditional way they are for the summer? Is the dining hall available? Is it open? Uh, or are there some other arrangements we'll have to focus on? Great. Uh, Dan Walken from, uh, from USA Today. What kinds of things would be on your official or unofficial checklist from a health standpoint or campus standpoint for game operations in the new normal, whether it's in the fall or whenever the 2020 season begins? Well, from a, from a game ops perspective, it starts with the team and the students. So we, we are working through all of the sort of issues that sort of fall into that category. Um, do we need to do something different with our locker room? Do we need to create additional space um, taking the locker room we have now and maybe using our game day locker room, the stadium for some students and the one in our football building for others? Um, is, do we approach practice differently um, in terms of the interaction uh, during the course of practice? What does the weight room look like? Um, how many people do we have in at a time? How do we maintain the equipment between reps? Um, all of those things are the sorts of issues we're working through. Once we get to the game day uh, dynamic, you know, it, it, it's, it's a great question because it goes from the mundane to the, uh, to, to the really important. Um, you know, there are just traditions we have about how we move on game day and what we do that you have to re reconsider. We, like a number of schools, have a walk from the football office to the stadium, which is a tradition that people care a lot about. Can you do that uh, in these circumstances? So we have to make all those decisions relative to the operation of the facility itself. Um, what, what will we want capacity to be? How will we define capacity? Uh, in the in the new normal going forward for the coming season. Um, what will the entries into the stadium look like? Um, how will we change the concession experience? You know, most people are going cashless now. Uh, how can we also manage the lines uh, um, there? For me, one of the more interesting questions, I think we can control a lot of that, of that in the stadium on the game day experience. I think tailgating creates a much more challenging dynamic to control and uh, to, to establish some regulations around and have it be the safest environment you can. Having said all that, the, the, the sort of the, the real standard point for us, starting point for us in a lot of our analysis is that when we look at, the, at, at keeping our students safe uh, and what their experience will be, we're focused on all our students. Um, so if our football team can play, um, our other students should be able to be in the stadium and watch them play. And so first and foremost, we're focused on their safety, uh, what that looks like, how they come into the stadium, what the seating arrangements are for the other students on campus. Hey, Ralph Russo from the Associated Press. In the past week or so, there have been comments from conference commissioners suggesting that while all of FBS starting the season at the same time is ideal, it might not be realistic. Some schools and conferences could act independently of others. Do you think a collaborative approach is becoming less likely? And what would be the ramifications of having a patchwork season like that? Well, let me stress that um, one of the things that's impressed me most during uh, this extraordinary period of time has been the level of collegiality and collaboration. Um, as you know, I get to um, interact with the uh, commissioners on a regular basis. <clears throat> through the CFP Management Committee. And um, I can't say enough about the extent to which they're working closely together, spending time together, communicating with each other. And I think that's the most important thing. It gives us a chance to come up with an overarching policy and an ability to start together. Having said that, I think we all recognize that there, there is a significant chance that that may not be possible. That either because states or individual colleges and universities take different approaches. You, you can't produce a season where all members um, are participating in Division I football in the same way. We just have to take the time to figure that out as we go. I, I think the critical issue is, is learning more about that and figuring out. There are a host of questions that become a byproduct of that. What, how, many, how many games do you need to have in a regular season to have a playoff? What might a re-engineered re schedule do to the postseason and the bowl games? Um, what about records? What about 
Heisman trophies? What about, you know, is, is a team, is a team whose school decides it can't participate uh, in a position where it's credited with a forfeit? I sure hope not. But all of that, all of that's got to be figured out as we move closer. There's just a, there's an interesting tension. I know you face it in your own jobs between how much time do you spend on those issues before you have more information. We, we can spend every hour of every day modeling uh, and trying to anticipate some of these, but each day brings new information. So we're trying to find the balance, but um, we are going to face a lot of those questions down the road. Rick, Rick Gray from WBBM Radio in Chicago. The Big Ten yesterday rolled out a mental health initiative for its athletes. Is Notre Dame doing anything more or different for its student athletes along similar lines? Well, we're pleased to be part of the Big Ten's effort. Um, I can't thank Commissioner Warren enough for inviting us to be part of it. Um, that invitation is as a result of us being a member of the conference in hockey. And uh, so we are fully represented in that effort. Um, our psychologists are part of the group uh, that are shaping the policies and having the discussions. So I applaud Kevin very much for taking this initiative. We're pleased to be part of it. And it's a focus for us as well. Uh, we've, as with other institutions, we've grown our staff in this area significantly in recent years in recognition of the challenges. The one thing I think it's critical to, to state though, however, in this is it's not an athletics only issue. The need for mental health services for students at America's colleges and universities generally has grown exponentially in recent years. There are athletic dimensions of it that are unique to be sure, but I always get a little nervous when we talk about it as an athletics issue because I'm afraid it marginalizes the extent to which it's a campus-wide issue. Billy Witt from the New York Times, is there anything from the last two months that you expect to become part of the new normal for you or Notre Dame? I hope it's not Zoom calls. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think, I think there are, it's, a, it's a great question because it's hard to get your arms around in the middle of it, but I do think there are things that will be part of the new normal. Um, I think recruiting will become more virtual um, as an important way to um, both save money, but empower everybody to recruit in a similar fashion. Um, I think scheduling is going to change significantly, especially for the Olympic sports. Um, out of this, regardless of what this year holds, out of this will come a significant need to readdress budgeting issues across colleges and universities generally. For our part of it, um, one of the big elements of that is travel. And so I think that you will see among um, what are generally referred to as the Olympic sports, I think the term's a little narrow, but among those sports, um, more regional play and less regular season travel. I think there may be even uh, changes made within conferences about how many conference games are required or what the conference postseason tournament looks like, all designed to reduce travel. And I think that would be a very positive development for college athletics. Because if you're not in a bus or an airplane, you're in your residence hall or in a classroom or elsewhere on campus. And uh, that would be a great outcome in addition to the money savings. Great. Jeff Eisenberg, um, how big of a concern are liability risks if stadiums and arenas do open to fans before the pandemic is over? I recognize public health is the top priority, but are you worried at all about protecting yourself against potential lawsuits from fans who claim to have been infected at a football game, for example? Well, I think we share, we share that concern and that risk with every enterprise that opens, with every restaurant, with every hotel, with every theme park, with every movie theater. And, um, you know, I think all we can do is make sure that we are complying with the best standard available to us. Rely on the experience and expertise of, of the scientific and medical communities, which by the way, colleges and universities tend to have a real advantage in terms of access to those resources. Be guided by those and move forward. We can't let the threat of that risk fundamentally change the experience of our students, whether they're student athletes or students on campus. So. Uh, that balancing act is tough, 
but we're not alone and you just have to make the best choice as you can. Heather Dinich, um, Heather Dinich from ESPN. Have you come up with a plan for what happens if, for, for instance, Brian Kelly contracts COVID-19? Well, on a university wide basis, we do have a plan for if any employee or student uh, contracts a disease. And we have had people affiliated with the university get COVID-19. Um, and that, that focuses on the same things that everyone in the country talks about, testing and tracing and isolation. And so um, we'll be engaged in all those things um, as our students return to campus. And I'm not sure there's any way in which it'll be unique in athletics. I suppose the one distinction for us might be the extent to which some members of the athletic community, and Brian's a good example, engage with the public more than others. And so we'll probably have discussions about how to either limit that engagement or how to shape it in a way to be safe for both Brian and the people he encounters. Uh, and not just Brian, but all of our coaches. Great, and we'll pivot uh, and stay, stay with Coach Kelly a little bit. The uh, university announced um, some reductions for academic and athletic leaders uh, in this tough time. This is Eric Hansen at the South Bend Tribune. In this tough time, is there ever gonna be a good time to announce an extension for Coach Kelly that's being talked about in the recruiting trail, assuming that's been near completion? Um, sure, let me, let me take that as an opportunity to first comment on the uh, pay reductions. Um, very pleased with the university's leadership in this regard. And I think many of you understand that um, at Notre Dame, we are very intentional about making sure that any decisions like that one get made as part of the university. So some people have asked me in the preceding weeks why we hadn't made an announcement about cuts for athletic administrators or coaches when other universities and conferences had. And the answer was simply because that would occur when the university made the announcement. And the university has made that announcement. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that the contribution that will come from athletics personnel as a result of salary adjustments will be over $1.5 million. Um, now, um, as it relates to Brian, the extension of Brian's contract, um, I, I, I view the two as separate in the sense that um, you have to make decisions to retain great faculty, great administrators on the camp at the campus, um, great educator coaches, um, regardless of the circumstances. Our discussion with Brian has been ongoing for a long time. Um, and as soon as we get the opportunity to uh, not meet by Zoom, I look forward to uh, hopefully making an announcement about it. Great. Another question that's coming in from a lot is about NBC. Given that you have an exclusive TV arrangement with NBC, is there flexibility there that if college football is played in less than filled stadiums this season to compensate for lost revenue with perhaps a spike in TV ratings? No. Um, th there's nothing about the contract which addresses uh, those circumstances. And um, I wouldn't anticipate asking for that. I, I think our our partnership is such that as both of us go through the challenge of this and keep in mind that the broadcast companies have significant challenges themselves, we want to be the best partner we can be. And so um, our goal is to try and meet our commitments to provide the content, um, but not to ask for anything special beyond that. If our schedule's altered, we'll be having discussions about what can be done to accommodate that. Um, NBC has a very crowded sports calendar and broadcast calendar generally, but they're great partners. And if we have to have that discussion about when we play, uh, we'll have that discussion. Great. Josh Friedman from uh, WGN TV. After the 0809 recession, more than 200 Olympic sport programs were cut nationwide. What do you anticipate the effect will be on non-revenue sports because of the pandemic? And do you believe Notre Dame will have to consider cutting programs? I don't know whether Notre Dame will have to consider cutting programs. Um, and I don't anticipate that happening, happening during the course of this as we try and figure our way through it right now. As I said earlier, I think we'll come out of this um, having to look at every element of our budget, um, both the revenue side and the expense side. 
And so I, I think whether it is, as I said earlier, a different approach to travel, um, whether maybe some sports don't get fully sponsored in the NCAA parlance, that is to say you don't make a full complement of scholarships available, um, or whether you change your sports program generally and say we're going to sponsor fewer sports. I, I, I'm not sure I, I can think of any school in the country for which those issues aren't on the table now. It, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the reduction in sports will be the leading edge of cost savings. Um, but I do think it would be um, disingenuous not to say that they, got, they have to be part of the consideration. I think you've uh, commented on this before, but Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal asked, what are the barred considerations you are looking at when it comes to reopening campus and allowing student athletes to return? More importantly, is there a scenario when athletes may be welcomed back before the rest of the student body? Well, the, the factors that the university is, is looking at to decide whether, to, whether and if to reopen campus relate, as you'd expect, solely to the safety of the students and the staff working with them. And they're relying on the expertise of a lot of people who are, uh, have, have great knowledge about the risks and the, and the potentials to do it. I, I don't think I'm uh, speaking out of turn or speaking for Father John to say, especially at a residential college like this, there's an enormous desire to get back on campus. It's so central to who we are that, that we want to figure it out. Uh, could there be circumstances where the campus is not yet open and um, student athletes would be welcomed back? Yes. Um, imagine, for example, that and this is purely hypothetical on my part, that campus chooses to open with the start of the fall term. And that's the first date in which the residence halls are open. Well, we've all agreed that at least six and probably more likely seven weeks would be required to safely prepare the football team. So in the interest of safety there, just as with the decision to open the dorms, you'd have to figure out a way to assemble those students to put them in an environment that's safe, whether it's a residence hall or you make other accommodations to feed them and to prepare them for the season. So in that regard, fall sport teams collecting for purposes of preparing may in fact happen before schools are fully open at a number of places. Great, just a few more here and we'll get you out of here. Um, Another question from the South Bend Tribune, are any conferences that you know of truly considering a conference only schedule this fall? If so, where does that leave Notre Dame football? Well, I, I, I think that, I don't want to speak for my, uh, uh, the, the conference commissioners, but I, I think they're considering every option. And I would be surprised if there's any conference that hasn't looked at a conference only alternative. Um, we are very comfortable that if that, if, if it goes that way, um, that we'll be fine. We will be able to play a, a high quality, full schedule um, the same number of games as other teams will play. Um, my hope and one of the things I've sort of encouraged a little bit as I, in my conversations is whether an, a possible model is conference schedule plus one. There's so many great sort of plus one games, traditional rivalries uh, that occur among schools. Um, you know, there's great rivalries in the state of Florida, for example, Clemson, South Carolina, you know, can you build it so you, you protect those, but other than that one game, uh, you, you're, you built your schedule around conferences. You know, we would love Wisconsin to be able to still play Notre Dame and Lambeau this year, or Arkansas to still visit. Um, and so we just have to see how that, how that evolves. But I am not concerned about our ability to have a challenging, robust schedule, even if the conferences go to a conference-only model. For more of the Olympic sports, how do you think it's possible to do more of the regional schedule when you're part of the ACC? Um, and could that lead to a move in conferences? Could that lead to a what? I'm sorry. A move in conferences. I'm sorry. No, no, it, it, it wouldn't it, it at all uh, necessarily lead to that. Um, you know, part of this, of course, especially having launched the ACC network, a lot of the focus is on having content available for broadcast and the home team still control that. So you'd still feed into the ACC network, a lot of great programming from those sports, whenever you hosted them, um, you could still have a conference championship where the teams from the conference come together and compete. 
You could also change your scheduling model so that you have more opportunities to travel once and play twice or three times as opposed to traveling from city to city to city. So I think there's lots of flexibility in that model. It doesn't do any, doesn't disrupt at all um, the, the, the core of the conference and the, the adhesion that makes conferences strong. You know, you could even change the scheduling model within the conference so that you're playing the more closely located schools more often in the regular season, as opposed to the way it is now. Great, two more questions and then we'll end here. Um, one of the questions was from Nicole Auerbach at The Athletic. When you mentioned that recruiting could be more virtual moving forward, does that mean recruiting travel budgets could be cut to save money or to be more of an emphasis on connecting virtually? Um, well, I, I think, it, I, I think it would, travel could be cut to save money. I think travel could be cut also to create a better experience for the coaches. Um, you know, I think the more strategic use of dead periods has been helpful to the quality of life for coaches, but especially for a national school like us, uh, the travel demands can be daunting. So I think the more this experiment causes us to say, you know what, we can still communicate our message. We can still connect with families and interact between those families and all of the resources on campus. Um, then maybe it's a good model that we ought to use a little more. We've struggled in this environment to sort of have the rules catch up with this because, you know, initially there are rules prohibiting you, for example, from bringing other people into the virtual discussion, your academic advisors, professors, other people you'd normally meet on a campus visit. So the rules are going to have to catch up with the, uh, the, the virtual environment, but I do think it's worked well enough, not, not to be the exclusive solution, but just to reduce expenses, make coaches' lives a little easier, and perhaps even make it a better experience for the families of student athletes who are being recruited. Uh, the, the season ticket deadline is coming up on May 15th. Without knowing exactly where we'll be with social dis distancing at that time, but assuming there will be some, how do you determine how many season tickets are the right amount to sell? Yeah, um, <clears throat> we're, we're sort of fortunate in the way our model works, which is a little different than a lot of institutions. So in the first instance, we sell season tickets, but we sell fewer than almost anybody else by design. So many people wanna make an annual pilgrimage to this place for a football game, that we're committed to always keeping at least 50% of the venue available without a season ticket. So tier one, we sell season tickets up to a limit. We then have a lottery that alumni and fans who are supporters of the university participate in. And through the lottery, individual game tickets are distributed, followed after the lottery by taking any tickets that are remaining and, and selling them on a single game basis. So each one of those gives us sort of a, a, a landmark to look at. And so we'll come off the season ticket sales and say, okay, this is what, this is what season ticket sales have produced for us. How do we feel about a crowd of that size in the current environment? Assuming we're still comfortable selling some more, we'd go into the lottery. So the way this is staged over the coming months, at each one of those junctures gives us an opportunity to have a little better data about, you know what, maybe we should just go into this season thinking only 45,000 people instead of 78,000 people. So. Our, our system lends itself to sort of going back and asking that question over and over again before we release tickets, and that's what we intend to do. Well, and on a, on a more of a fun uh, one from Mark Skoll from WNDU, Coach McGraw obviously had a great run with, run with the Irish, and all the Notre Dame football coaches who have won a national title have statues. Is there any future plans on building a statue for Coach McGraw? I can promise everyone, every fan of Coach McGraw, of which there are, innumerable fans that uh, we will honor her in an appropriate way. Awesome, Jack. Hey, I appreciate you taking the time. For everyone at home, you're more than welcome to go to und.com backslash press box in the next hour for a full download of the audio transcript of this uh, press conference. But I appreciate everyone taking the time. And thanks again, Jack. Thanks to you. And thanks to everybody who participated. Be Irish. <laughs>